the most accepted book ever written, the New Testament. This is the book that begins with the line vanished from ever ruling again from the throne of David over Judah. The kings of Judah, the felled ancestral tree leaving only a stump, and from that stump a twig sprouts of a completely different line who becomes the anointed one, Moshiach, to the Christian's Messiah, of chapter 11 of Isaiah. Verses 1 and 2, when the Spirit alights upon the twig that sprouts from the shoot that grows from the stump of Jesse, King David's father. This man comes from chapter 11, comes in the day of the Lord to be God's prophet like Moses. And is described in Isaiah 53. A description that could never describe Jesus Christ, who cannot be the Moshiach of Isaiah 11. His line is not from the stump of Jesse. The New Testament of Christianity has many statements of the prophecy of the Hebrew Bible being satisfied or fulfilled in the stories and accounts of Jesus. Not one is true. Not one. It is arguably the most deceptive book ever written based on the billions of people who have been deceived. There are two billion admitted uh, 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 people who say they follow Christianity. Now, that doesn't mean they all go to church every Sunday or that they're familiar with what Isaiah 53 is or the theology and doctrine of Christianity. Um, but they do account themselves Christians, so they're responsible for everything they say they are. They need to do a little bit more research. We are in the age of the Internet. Everybody can find and look at what I'm talking about. You might need to put aside your Old Testament Christians and use the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, the one you took for them, telling them they could not read it, that it was prophetic of Jesus Christ, and that Isaiah 53 describes him. That's what you say to the chosen people of God. You say, Jews, you sin too much. God, got, God left you and came to us as though y'all aren't sinners. God knows when he made man, everybody was going to sin. That's why he gave us these laws and rules and commandments. It's not for him. It's because he knows life is harsh on the planet, but he has reasons for it. And he says, live your life by these rules, by, by, by this, these, this morality, these philosophies, and you'll get through as good as you can get through. Oh, isn't that nice? And he gave that book to a people he chose, a people you have walked all over throughout history. And in Isaiah 51, and the, in the description, the description of God's righteous servant, the teacher of righteousness, who makes the many righteous, begins in chapter 52. Last three verses, 13 through 15. Then you have chapter 53. Of the that, that describes the disfigured, blemished prophet of God, a man of suffering throughout his life, familiar with disease, sickness that brings you to grief because it can kill you. None of which is Jesus Christ. The deceptions, the deceptions are written in such a manner as to keep the reader from verifying the reference prophecy. The deceptions are bolstered by the reader's belief that a Bible certainly does not contain lies and deception. In my opinion, the worst deceptions come from Scripture that literally alters the words and ascribing new meaning to them. Altering the words is one and then you're saying these words sometimes also is altered 
that what they really mean is this. Meanings that were never intended as written in the Hebrew Bible. The book of Matthew. This is the first book. You really don't have to go past in analyzing this first book before you come to realize there's no reason to read the rest of it. It's just like the book of Revelations with all these things going to happen and then Jesus comes, but in verse 7 of chapter 1, right off the bat, he says to the writer, he says to the writer, John, maybe his apostle may not be, <clears throat> through an angel, he says, those who pierce me with the spear shall see me return. Well, everybody knows they're dead. He didn't return. So, what, why read the rest of the revelation? None of it's true. None of it. Or, or, the prophecy is not stated in full, leaving out the parts that are not fulfilled. And rarely does he tell you the name of the prophet being referenced. The prophecy of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 10, is a good example, and I have three. Jesus changed, verse 10, from defeating Rome to being executed by Rome. Verse 9. Rejoice greatly, fair Zion. Raise a shout, fair Jerusalem. Lo, your king is coming to you. He is victorious, triumphant, yet humble, riding on an ass, on a donkey fouled by a she-ass. Verse 10. He shall banish chariots from Ephraim and horses from Jerusalem. The warrior's bow shall be banished. He shall call on the nations to surrender. And his rule shall extend from sea to sea and from ocean to land's end. That's Zechariah chapter 9 verse 10. That's from the Hebrew Bible. That's the, that, that is the prophecy that's about to be referenced. Rides into Jerusalem on an ass. And in Jesus' time, if it applied, and it didn't, and it didn't, if it had applied, he was to defeat Rome, call on all the nations at that time in the Middle East, as far as anybody knew, to surrender under his rule and rule all the Middle East, which would seem like the world. I think Cyrus of Persia did the same thing. He said, I've been anointed king of all kingdoms of the world. But I suspect it was just Europe and the Middle East. <laughs> we, we hadn't had the, uh, the pilgrims yet. Okay, so in those days, in the days of the prophets, invading forces used, used chariots for battle in the rural areas, rode upon horses like police in Jerusalem, and shot arrows with bows to enforce, force their will upon the people of Israel. In the days of Zechariah, this was the Assyrians and Babylonians. In the days of Jesus, this was Rome. Jesus did ride an ass into Jerusalem, but he did not banish the chariots and horses and arrows of Rome, and his rule did not extend from sea to sea and from ocean to land's end. Matthew says, this is chapter 21, verses 4 and 5, Holy Bible. Matthew says, All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt, the fowl of an ass. Now that says, and. Uh, he didn't come, the prophecy doesn't say he rides an ass and a colt. So I don't, I don't know what that is. Now, Luke the historian. He was a considered, well, he's Luke the historian. He's not one of the 12 disciples. He wrote on his account as a historian. Verse 31. Then he, Jesus, took unto him the 12, 
and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. That's him, by the way, Son of Man. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on. And they shall scourge him and put him to death. And the third day he shall rise again. That's Luke. He changed verse 10. Well, where did he get the account from the historian? Well, if... Now, he may have gotten it that says Jesus said, but as I understand it, every verse in this book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Unlike the Torah, which is divinely given verbally, dictated to Moses, the writers of the New Testament are said to, because they have it in quotes, the first book is found 40 years after his death. You know, this is a time of illiteracy and ignorance. Uh, I know scribes are mentioned often, but uh, there's no account of somebody who simply followed and chronicled every word that came out of Jesus' mouth. There's no account of the Sermon on the Mount that has ever been found that could have been incorporated into a gospel. So what the, what the Christians do, because of that um, weakness in their scripture, is say, all of it is divine, all of it is inspired whoever wrote it by the Holy Spirit of God. Not so the Torah. With the Torah, a spirit lit upon Moses entered him and God was in his spirit and he could hear God speak just like Ezekiel. If you've been looking at my, if you've seen any of my other tapes, that's covered. <clears throat> So Jesus said that we're going to Jerusalem, that's what's going to happen to me, and that's what the prophets, all the prophets have written of me. Well, I've got 20 of them. You've got 20 of them, Christians, in your Holy Bible. It's called the Old Testament. It ends with the writings of the prophets. Or well, it doesn't end, but anyway, they're all in there. Well, read them. Read all the prophets say of him, this son of man. Go read it for me. Go read it for me. You won't find it, but yeah, make something up, right? That's easy enough. The Hebrew Bible, Christian Old Testament, the great skull of Isaiah found with the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, uh, the, the sect of the Essenes who were prolific writers and for some reason never get mentioned, never get mentioned in the New Testament, these prolific writers. Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, Saints. Where are they? There's three of them. Orthodox, conservative, reformer. Ultra-Orthodox, Orthodox, and conservative. Where's the third one? I got left there. Maybe you just don't want to mention there's another group of us, but they write everything. We don't want to talk. And they got their own gate up front. We really don't want to talk about it because their founder his name is the teacher of righteousness. They believe a hundred years ago that he was the man described in Isaiah 53 and literally gave him that name. And he even writes. We have writings from him. Midrash form, commentary on different books. Amos, I think, is one of them. Not necessarily Isaiah. Great scroll of Isaiah, Apocrypha, and the Pseudepigrapha are all the possible scripture that Jesus could be referencing. And you'll have to go look those up. I had to. <laughs> Basically, it's, it's one of them is writings that are put in the name of a different person to help give the story validity. Uh, Christianity and Judaism both agree that the writers of the Gospels were not the disciples of Jesus, even though their names were used. Except for Luke, he's an historian. That's all the possible scriptures Jesus could be referencing, and not one book mentions a son of man, God's righteous servant of Isaiah 53, a son of God, 
a man who is God, or any man, to be delivered to the Gentiles, mocked, scourged, and put to death, a man who dies for the sins of other men, any man who is to rise from the dead on the third day, or a man who is sacrificed, or made to sacrifice himself by God. There's no, it's completely made up. There it is in your first book, Matthew, New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. And it's not Matthew, his disciple, by all accounts. The Hebrew Bible consists of a collection of writings dating from approximately the 13th to the 3rd centuries before the Common Era, BCE. These books were included in the Jewish canon by the Talmudic sages at Yedna around the end of the 1st century Common Era. After the destruction of the Second Temple, which was in 70 Common Era. However, there are many other Jewish writings from the Second Temple period. The Second Temple is what was destroyed by Rome in 70, which were excluded from the Hebrew Bible. Oh, this is the explanation. These are known as the Apocrypha and the Pseudodipocrypha. I didn't know I was reading the, the description of these words. The Apocrypha. In Greek, that means hidden books. Are Jewish books from the period not preserved in the Hebrew Bible, but included in the Latin Vulgate and Greek Septuagint Old Testaments. The Apocrypha are still regarded as part of the canon of the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches, and as such, the number is six. The term pseudepigrapha in Greek is falsely attributed, which was given to Jewish writings of the same period, which were attributed to authors who did not actually write them. This was widespread in Greco-Roman antiquity, in Jewish, Christian, and pagan circles alike. This would include such books as Adam, Noah, Enoch, Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Ezekiel, Baruch, and Jeremiah. I, I have a lot more description. I'm trying to get past it. In Matthew chapter 1, the angel of the Lord in a dream of Joseph said, and this, this appears after the line of the kings of Judah, in Matthew 1, uh, which includes part of the line that, that's not in the Hebrew Bible. Because from the banished king, they had to start, uh, they had to go do some research, I suppose, <laughs> on this line of the kings of Judah and came up with a few more folks and then to Joseph and then, of course, Jesus. It, the angel of the Lord, in a dream, of Joseph said, in other words, the, the angel of the Lord has not come to Joseph and said that the word of the Lord or uh, God says, okay, this is just a dream he's having. And, and the, there's no reason to believe the actual angel of the Lord with God in him has come to Joseph. It's, that's not how it reads. It's a dream. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now, as I've mentioned before, I am convinced, and I think anybody who listens to the arguments would be convinced, that the accounts of Jesus are simply a story. There's too many different variations. And this story was out there when this was written. So they already know he dies for sin. So it's kind of convenient to have this dream that all of a sudden this baby is going to, you know. So the angel of the Lord is now a prophet, a seer, can see the future. And you say, well, God could. Okay. Why don't you say God came to me? Why don't you just say it like it is in the Hebrew Bible? God came to Joseph and said, I'll give you a reason, a possibility. These writers of these Gospels, 
with their knowledge on the Hebrew Bible and trying to attach a story to it that doesn't fit a people whose temple had just been destroyed and they had been driven from their land and were destitute and needed money and they knew that the Gentiles from telling this story at the Essene Gate and other gates would love it. And they also knew they could get away with just about anything. A society with no schools, no universities, illiteracy and ignorance was the way of the day. No bookstores, no scrolls, no internet, absolute ignorance. Like children, and everybody just acted on emotion. The reasoning capabilities were nil and none. Because that's what education gives you, if nothing else. The ability to reason and figure things out. So you can put just about anything over these people, but today, these same lies, these same deceits, taking in two billion people, with the knowledge that we have to believe in these things is absolutely astounding. Absolutely astounding. So he says, "For he shall, this is still the dream, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Okay, Jesus means, they shall call his name Jesus, and apparently that means because he shall save his people from their sins. And they'll call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And that is uh, the correct interpretation of Emmanuel in the Hebrew language. But you have to ask yourself, who is he talking about? Which was spoken of the Lord. Who's the Lord here? Is this already Jesus in this dream? Is that... Angel of the Lord proclaimed him Messiah. He shall die for the forgiveness of sins. That's got nothing to do with Messiah. Moshe, we just saw it. He rides and asks in Jerusalem and defeats the enemy. He's a conqueror. He's a king. He leads the Jewish people. And, and this whole story starts out with, this is the man who cannot lead the Jewish people. Here's his line. He's from the field ancestral tree that was banished. And cannot be the man described in Isaiah chapter 11, whether you accept that he's banished or not. The fact is, he comes from a different line. The Moshe, the anointed one, cannot be Jesus Christ, period. And I don't know who, who we're really talking about. Spoken of, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet. Who? Who? No, this was never spoken. This is not in the Hebrew Bible. Those are the prophets. That's not there. It's an outright lie. It's an outright manipulation of the scripture. By who? Apparently Jewish people who were, had just been set off into the Roman dispersal. Now, I'm not positive about that, but they were writing about a Jew, right? And it's funny. God comes from Adam, and as though God didn't know they were going to come up with this. I mean, he wrote the scripture, and he wrote it such that they would come up with this with the Talmud. He left many things vague. So there was an oral tradition, just like there is in Islam, that was finally written down. And in that tradition, references to Adam is a reference to Rome and Christianity, and Gentiles pretty much in general. God wasn't allowed to cross into or cross through uh, Adam with Moses. He was with Moses. Moses couldn't go through. The tribes, the, the Egyptian slaves, the Israelites, they couldn't go through. Uh, they actually camped there for a long time by one account, uh, years, and just stayed outside of it. And then they finally went around. Uh, and yet, Isaiah 63 and again, books 51 to the end, uh, you can find the, the Roman dispersal in all of them. Every single one of them. 
God says in Isaiah 63, who is this coming from Adam? Who is associated with Esau, who is the brother of Jacob, who was renamed Israel. The patriarch of the Jewish people. If they all gather as one man, that is Israel. They can't gather as one man anymore and haven't been able to since basically when they gathered at Sinai, also called Oreb. Actually, it's called Oreb in, in Malachi. But that's where the Ten Commandments were given. So uh, he doesn't tell us in this dream. Isn't that funny? Actually, I can't tell where, the, where he's talking about the dream and not. A very shoddy writing by the Holy Spirit, Spirit of God. Very shoddy. The sentence, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the prophet by the Lord, is an example of writing a verse that you do not want to be verified by the reader. The prophet is easy to identify as Isaiah and his account of Emmanuel. But it has nothing to do with the birth of a child named Emmanuel by a virgin. The Hebrew word used in Isaiah, and I'm going to get to it, is young woman, and for good reason. She's the concubine of Isaiah. <laughs> concubine, not married to. Doesn't sound like there'd be any reference to a virgin in that chapter, but we'll get to it. Because, because it is specifically pointed out, and there's really no reason for it, that he's married to a prophetess. And this isn't her. Because <laughs> we, we'll see that, I think it's chapter 9. So, this is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. The Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shir Jahub, Jahub, to meet Ahaz, that's King Ahaz, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool. So they must be in Jerusalem, the upper pool. That would be in the temple area. Shir Jahub is footnoted to mean, that's what his name means, a remnant will turn back. Isaiah says to Ahaz, Assuredly, my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look, the young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him in my new well. And so that's going to be the son. That this woman who's pregnant, his concubine, she's not talking about the prophetess, because they would have said his wife, not this young woman. She's not a virgin. She's not a virgin in the verse. Surely my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look, the young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The meaning is about the, 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 the coming defeat of the northern kingdom and the possibility that Judah is going to be overrun. God is with us. Look, here's a sign for you. And, and basically, I believe Isaiah is saying that, that, well, okay, that's speculation. Isaiah writes, chapter 8, verse 3, I was intimate with the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. Mahir Shalal Hashbaz is footnoted to mean pillage hastens, looting speeds. Remember, they, they, these, these children are signs and portents. And here, here it says the Lord told him to name, to name this child uh, Mahir Shalal Hashbaz. That's why I think Emmanuel, I think Isaiah was told that to, to, for, this, for this concubine in front of King Ahaz to, to comfort him, that they wouldn't be defeated. 
And the prophetess is footnoted to be the wife of Isaiah. The young woman to give birth, who is with Isaiah, Shir Jashub, and the house at the end of the conduit of the upper pool would be his concubine. There is nothing to believe she is a virgin. Isaiah, Isaiah does not give an account of the mother of only a remnant will turn back as she symbolizes the bride of God, the Jewish people, who is absent until the remnant returns in repentance. Isaiah writes, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, So I will wait for the Lord, who is hiding his, ha his face from the house of Jacob, and I will trust in him. Here stand I and the children the Lord has given me, as signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. Each of Isaiah's children, only a remnant will turn back, with us is God, and pillage hasten, looting speeds, have a meaning as a sign and as a portent. The book of Isaiah the book of two kings and the book of two chronicles provide the historical account to understand the names of the children of the <clears throat> that the Lord gives Isaiah as signs and portents. I'm not going to give chapters and pages. Uh, I just there's just various verses that uh, explain who these kings are as, as that are mentioned in uh, at the conduit of the upper pool. In the days of King Pekah of Israel, King Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria came and captured Ajan, Abel, Beth, Maka, Janoah, Kadesh, Hazor, Gilead, Galilee, the entire region of Nap Napatali, and deported all the inhabitants to Assyria. And I'm going to mention this brief history, not really for uh, this deception of the New Testament as much as I was so unfamiliar with it. I didn't realize the, uh, the, the importance of two, two kingdoms and how different they were and how uh, the, fir the first one was defeated uh, and Judah hung on for many more years, but then they finally got the port. <clears throat> it's, it's just kind of interesting, but that you can see by the references to uh, Gilead and Galilee that this is uh, the northern kingdom. All those little towns and everything. They were, that's what that's all about. Hoshi, son of Ella, conspired against Pekah, son of Ramallah, attacked him and killed him. King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah, son of Ramalia of Israel, advanced on Jerusalem for battle. That would be Judah. They besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. At that time, King Rezin of Aram recovered Elath, one of those towns taken, for Aram. He drove out the Judites from Elath, and Edomites, Edom, and Edomites came to Elath and settled there, as is still the case. Ahaz sent messengers to King tiglath pileser of Assyria to say, I am your servant and son. Come and deliver me from the hands of the king of Aram and from the hands of the king of Israel, who are attacking me. <laughs> the king of Assyria re responded to this request. The king of Assyria marched against Damascus and captured it. He deported its inhabitants to Kerr and put resin to death. <laughs> God had me put together the actual, I had to do a, I was an oil and gas uh, attorney and I had to put genealogical records together to tell oil companies these are the people that you lease so that you own their minerals before you drill. And I put all this together. It all works real good. Trust me, it comes out like, I, like I'm telling you. It's going to come out <laughs> instead of trying to verify all this. In the twelfth year of King Ahaz of Judah, Hoshi, son of Elah, became king over Israel in Samaria. That's the northern kingdom. It's been called Israel, Samaria, 
and Ephraim. Ephraim was uh, one of the uh, children of Jacob, and uh, he got a very large allotment. It starts at the lands. You have Judah down south, leading almost to Egypt. You have Benjamin, a strip between these two, and then that's the south kingdom. And then you have the north kingdom, and it starts out with Samaria. I mean, uh, Ephraim. And up in here is uh, where Samaria was, a town that one of the kings ruled from, so they called the whole area Samaria. I didn't know all those things. That surprised me. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria, he captured Samaria. He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled. And so that first deportation was, was it sounds like the town's... Uh, north and uh, west of uh, the Sea of Galilee, up, up, up high north, Nepotalan area. And um, this seems to be lower. And settled then in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gazan, and in the towns of Medea. That all became a part of Persia eventually. That's, that's the Syria and Babylon territories. Ahaz slept with his fathers and was buried in the city in Jerusalem. His body was not brought to the tombs of the kings of Israel. In the third year of King Hoshi, son of Allah of Israel, Hezekiah, son of King Ahaz, he's a great king of, of the Jewish people, back, especially uh, somebody who was needed at that time because of the constant attacks against Judah and now the, the northern kingdom who although they often fought and tried to conquer Judah themselves, but they were still, you know, there were still plenty of other Israelites uh, there then, later to become and known as Jews. So, uh, Hezekiah became king of Judah. So when the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out with your son, Shir Jasu, to meet Ahaz at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, by the road of the foolish field, and say to him, told Isaiah, this is the lead up to what I was reading earlier on, say this to him, be firm and be calm. Do not be afraid and do not lose heart on account of those two smoking stubs of firebrands, on account of the raging of Rezin and his Armenians and the sons of Ramallah, because the Armenians with Ephraim and the son of Ramaliah have plotted against you, saying, We will march against Judah. There's Ephraim. Uh, against Judah and invade and conquer it, and we will set up as king in it the son of Tabil. Now, the kings of Judah went, as you think of, uh, for instance, Britain, a constant succession of the same line. Not so in the kingdom of Israel. They are always throwing one out and bringing somebody else in. Kill, lots of assassinations. Thus said the Lord God, it shall not succeed. It shall not come to pass. That's what Isaiah was supposed to go tell Ahaz. And another chapter and verse, And Isaiah said to Ahaz, Assuredly my Lord will give you a sign of his own accord. Look. The young woman is with child and about to give birth to a son. Let her name him. God is with us. God is with you. That's where it comes from. Let her name him Emmanuel. By the time, it's very important because remember signs, well, he's a sign. Here's the portent. Here's what you look for. By the time he learns to reject the bad and choose the good, people will be feeding on curds and honey. For before the lad knows how to reject the bad and choose the good, this is Emmanuel, by the way. I don't think he was born sinless or of a virgin in the story. The crown whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. And when Isaiah writes, I was intimate with the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said to me, Name him Maher Shalah Hashbaz, 
For before the boy learns to call father and mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoils of Samaria and the delights of Risen and the son of Ramalia shall be carried off before the king of Assyria. The Lord is saying, he said this, he said this, and he said this, and what he's saying is, the Lord is saying that Emmanuel and Mahir Shalah Hashbaz are signs by their names and portents by their individual maturations. When one learns what sin is <laughs> and the other one learns to talk. Because that's what this is all about. That the prophet said. I don't see a real prophecy in there. It's a story that's got Isaiah in it. The name with us is God is a sign for Ahaz that Iran and Israel will not succeed in their attack on Judah and Jerusalem and that when Emmanuel learns right from wrong, Iran and Israel will be gone from the lands they rule. That's the two kings whose land... The name pillage, hasten, looting speeds is a sign for Isaiah to watch for pillaging and looting in Damascus and Samaria when Maharshalah Hashbaz begins to talk. But for before he calls Isaiah father, Iran and Israel will be carried off by the king of Assyria. Based on the historical count that I just gave you, and the Lord's signs importance, Isaiah is speaking to Ahaz at the conduit of the upper pool no earlier than the eleventh year of his reign. For in his twelfth year, the first year of King Hoshi of Israel, the king of Assyria responded to the request of Ahaz, marched against Damascus, captured it, and deported its inhabitants to Kirk. And in the ninth year of King Hoshi of Israel, the king of Assyria captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. And the hasted and speeded pillaging and looting of Aram in Samaria would have taken place during this deportation. This means that Emmanuel would have been about nine years old when he came to know right from wrong. From all that I just read, what, what came, this, that, you had to piece it all together from three different books, Chronicles and Two Kings and another one. He'd have been about nine years old when he came to know right from wrong. And that Maher Shalal Hashbaz spoke his first words when the king of Assyria deported Israel. So we know when he learned to talk. That's what it's about. It's got nothing to do with, with somehow hiding some sign that uh, this with us is God is going to forgive sins. I mean, there's nothing in here about that. But look what Matthew says. I had, Joseph had a dream. And he's writing this, whoever Matthew is. He's writing this. So let me say, Joseph had a dream. This is, this is 70 years after Jesus died. Okay, you got to add 30 more years. That's 100 years. You know, I can't give you my ancestral history past my grandparents. I can't go back 100 years. There's no way. <laughs> Much less hundreds. But anyway, from the account of signs importance of the deportation of the northern kingdom and Aram, and that the southern kingdom was protected by God, the writer of Matthew says, the birth of Jesus by a virgin was prophesied by the prophet according to the angel of the Lord in a dream of Joseph. There was no such prophecy. I just read it all to you. There's no prophecy in there. Isaiah doesn't speak of prophecy. He talks about his kids. The Lord talked to him and said, name your kids this. His sign's important. That's, that's not prophecy. There was a young woman with child, and that, and that child was named Emmanuel as a sign important that Judah would not be defeated and deported along with the northern kingdom. The most deceptive book ever written. 
it's being written after the fact, after the fact that this story's been going on for 170 years. First time anything's written of this story of this man that in just, it is, it's a, it's a typical drama, action, thriller. It's got all of it in it. You know, you have a man who's perfect and yet he's murdered, killed by the occupiers of the land. You know, it's, it's a tearjerker, but it's also, you know, I mean, it's a great story. And it was a time of storytellers. Nobody could read. If you could tell great stories, if you could put a lot of into it, and people liked listening to you, and you infatuated them, they'd throw you a coin, give you some food, help you around if you were old. Telling stories was a way to make a living, storytellers. And that's what this was. The Essenes would have known if a man was, if a man being called the teacher of righteousness, they would have known he was talking about Isaiah 53 and they'd have gone and found him. And they'd have been there when he wrote that essay. They'd have gone and found him because they knew everything about Isaiah. And from what they were reading, they knew it wasn't him because Isaiah de describes a, a, a defective, could be disfigurement, defective, blemished. Sickness. Leprosy. They called this man in the town of the leper scholar. Now leprosy is all they knew. It doesn't mean it just means disease. It's about the only one they could see and understand. They didn't understand cancer. But that's what they call him the leper scholar, and scholars because he makes the many righteous by his knowledge. First six verses are by the witnesses who are sick. They're sick emotionally. They suffer guilt. Because, because they keep violating God's laws. And they finally listen to the teacher of righteousness. This is what the, sto the story of Isaiah 53 is about. It's about a man. It starts out with all these people that are sick. Well, what's wrong? Well, we've got a teacher of righteousness. Let's figure it out. Oh, I know. He's got to take, he's got to remove their guilt for them. He's going to accept their guilt. But that's not like the Jesus story. God's not going to put guilt on him, whatever that means. I mean, you can only feel so guilty before you pass out. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not even possible. But, I mean, that's, that's, so, so what does he do? Well, he's righteous, so he goes and gets him and says, look, God's with me. God's with me. He came and told me he crushed me with disease. And he has prepared me. I had to go through all kinds of things. Wounding and punishment. He had to beat me down because I had such a fiery spirit. Because I was so emotional. Because I didn't like talking to people. And here I am to tell you. And, and then bring them, convince them to make their faith strong and remove the guilt by removing the sin with my words. The leper scholar. It's so easy to understand. But I'll give you this, Christians. The rabbis don't understand it either. Now, I'm new to religion and I'm trying to figure it out. I hadn't really been amongst any of them yet other than sitting in churches or synagogue, that I wasn't associating with anybody. That's why God wanted me to be an atheist and a Gentile, because that's who comes, that's who's described in Isaiah 53. With me, it's the disfigured, diseased, prophet of God, a man of suffering, injury, God made sure of it. That was that. God came to me and my life became a misery. That's what that, and, and to me, you know, I had so many bad things happen to me. When something bad would happen again, I'd just say, well, that, that's just part of the course. That's, that's just my life. I, I'm in a hospital every two years getting stitched up, getting cast, getting my teeth replaced that got knocked out. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, my parents would say, well, he's hyperactive. Yeah, he shouldn't jump off roofs and stuff. <laughs> Aim from high tree branches. <laughs> yeah, but who gave me the inspiration to do that? God's with me. I gotta have a great story from this guy. Go jump off the roof. You know, but you can't hear him. Oh, he can talk to you without hearing. Him. He can get you to do anything he wants. <laughs> He's taking credit for most of it. He said, "Hey, remember that time? He'll even take me in vision. He took me back in vision to when I got shot." 
And he went through days of us being out at this ranch, and he he said, uh, "You see, do you see what that thing right there in that conversation?" I said, "It's like I was blind. What happened? How come I'm not seeing any of this? All this dissension amongst the gang." <laughs> but anyway, okay, I've got. There, there's actually, believe it or not, Matthew has more force, and we're not out of the first book yet. We haven't even gotten to the crucifixion. So I'm going to have to pick it up in another tape. Again, you can't, it is the most accepted book ever written based on, I couldn't put this in the title, based on the number of people to see. You can't outdo Christianity and all the people who believed in Jesus. I mean, I don't know what the final number is, but <laughs> trillions? I, I mean, I don't know. You got two billion walking the face of the earth right now. Well, that's my opinion anyway. I'm sure there'll be those who would who would argue with me. But uh, they better learn how to read the old te uh, the Hebrew Bible before they come to me. If I decide to give them my presence and talk to them, of course. Their Messiah, their God, said he came in my name. He came in my name. He said he's Isaiah 53, teacher of righteousness. For that matter, so did the founder of the Essenes. But he's, he's not a problem for me. The Essenes apparently didn't make it out of the destruction of, of Israel during the, the revolts. And that's why they hid those scrolls, by the way. That's, that's what was going on when they hid the scrolls. <clears throat> Everybody, they were getting murdered, too. Rome was taking, just taking everything down. And you think God didn't know that? He knew the Jew. He wanted them dispersed, by the way. He wants a Jew from every country. He wants a Jew from, from with, with the culture and history of every single country, but being a Jew because of his laws and commandments. Because he gave them that name. He made it up. But, you know, he made it up Hebrew. He made it up Jew. But we can identify them. They're hated all throughout the world. And God chose them. Why? Well, they got all kinds of reasons. We're chosen because of this and that and that and this. But here's another reason. To test the world. Will you mess with those I have chosen? The God of creation. The God of humanity. The God of this earth. Will you mess with my stuff? Is what it comes down to in the parlance and the vernacular of today. You took my kids' books. You disrespected my kids. You worship false idols, gods that are not me. And you say I accept human sacrifice, Christians, and that I committed human sacrifice for you. And for what reason what did I get from you? Oh, that's right. You get to keep sinning and violating, violating my commandments and laws because Jesus forgives even those you haven't made yet. That makes, a, you know, that's the reasoning of antiquity. Your books of antiquity, your beliefs are of antiquity, your reasoning capabilities are of antiquity. If you can digest what's in these words. Continuing, the most deceptive book ever written, the New Testament. In Matthew chapter... 4 verses 13 through 17 Matthew says and leaving Nazareth he Jesus came and dwelt in Capernaum which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zebulon and Nephtalim that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah that's Isaiah the prophet saying this is he's about to quote Isaiah, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what the verse actually says. 
For if there were to be any break of day for that land, which is in straits, only the former king would have brought abatement to the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. The former king would get it out of its straits. While the latter one, that would be the current one, would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. Who is that? Cut. Who is that? I don't know what you're say. Okay, two. In continuing, the most accepted book ever written, the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 13 to 17, Matthew says, And leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast, in the borders of Zebulon and Nepotelum, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon, and the land of Nepotelum, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is what the verse actually says. For if there, if there were to be any break of day for that land which is in straits, only the former king would have brought abatement, abasement to the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, while the latter one would have brought honor to the way of the sea, the other side of the Jordan, and Galilee of the nations. This is not a prophecy to be fulfilled and has nothing to do with Jesus. It, this is more of a plagiarism altered to fit Jesus into the Hebrew Bible. This is a statement in the last verse of chapter 8 concerning the coming defeat of the northern kingdom of Samaria, also called the kingdom of Israel and Ephraim, by the Assyrians. That ends chapter 8 regarding the northern kingdom, and then chapter 9 begins regarding the southern kingdom. And an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. From Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 5. The people that walked in darkness have seen a brilliant light. On those who dwelt in a land of gloom, light has dawned. You have magnified that nation, have given it great joy. They have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at reaping time, as they exult when dividing the spoil. For the yoke that they bore and the stick on their back the rod of their taskmaster. You have broken as on the day of Medea. Truly, all the boots put on to stamp with and all the garments donned in infamy have been fed to the flames, devoured by fire. For a child has been born to us. A son has been given to us. And authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God, is planning grace, the eternal father, a peaceable ruler. So this man will be, uh, bring grace to the land and be a very peaceable ruler as king, King Hezekiah. From 2 Kings chapter 17 verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshi, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. 
He deported the Israelites to Assyria and settled them in Hala, at the river Habor, at the river Gozim, and in the towns of Medea. Which I've already mentioned before regarding the, de the defeat and deportation of the northern kingdom. The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutai, Ava, Hamath, and Sipparvaim, and he settled them in the towns of Samaria in place of the Israelites. They took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its towns. So those are the Gentiles of the northern kingdom. The Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1 verse is an exaltation of the birth of King Hezekiah of Judah in the southern kingdom. The Assyrians were now threatening Judah, which is why there was a great exaltation at the birth of Hezekiah. This is not a prophecy of Jesus in Capernaum and that a great light has been seen by the people living there with Jesus beginning the preaching of repentance. Jesus has nothing to do with these verses. Not then, and not in his lifetime. It is about kingdoms and kings defeating and deporting the Jewish people and importing Gentiles to the northern kingdom in chapter 8. And in chapter 9, the hope for the newborn heir to the throne in the southern kingdom of Judah would be a great king, graced by God to lead Judah as a peaceable ruler in dangerous times. One verse is about the northern kingdom, and the next verse in a new chapter is about the southern kingdom. The verses had nothing to do with one another or with Jesus. Verses of the Hebrew Bible lifted out and made a part of the Gospel of Matthew with the words that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, the prophet. He spoke it, but it was not prophecy. The story of Jesus has nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. The writer of Matthew tells his readers a prophecy has been fulfilled by Jesus and combines two verses changing their meaning in context and includes an act of Jesus to make it seem as though Jesus was in that prophecy. That the prophecy of Isaiah includes Jesus preaching repentance. From the days of the writings of the New Testament through the Middle Ages, the world was illiterate, for the most part, and very few people had access to the Hebrew Bible scrolls or could read the Greek translation of it later translated to English. No one could examine the veracity of these unknown writers of the Gospels and determine if a prophecy was really fulfilled and relied on religious leaders' assertions that they were written by divine inspiration. There's nothing divine about this passage in the book of Matthew. It is intentionally written to mislead the reader. Today, for, for the Christians, there is a new complete translation of the Hebrew Bible into English that is far superior to the Hebrew to Greek to English translations that make the Holy Bible's Old Testament much easier to read and comprehend. It is the Jewish Publication Society's 1985 Tanakh begun in 1955 that is used here and in uh, my books, Isaiah 53 in the Day of the Lord and the Life of God's Righteous Servant of Isaiah 53, which of course is me. Jesus came in my name. He came as the teacher of righteousness, as Isaiah 53. That's my name. Okay, that's all I have on uh, the book of Matthew. Thank you very much for uh, 